I do apologize if today it sounds like I have a bit of a cold. It's because today I still have a bit of a cold. Hello there and welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room for another project. Today I'll be showing you how I took my favorite Victorian corset pattern and modified it to make the more fashion sort of couture inspired corsets that I wore in the Arcana lookbook. As I said, this black sparkly version was actually the mock-up for the copper version that you saw earlier in the video, but both of these I made within about a week. So I'll be talking you through that process and also showing you some pictures back my blog in my pre-YouTube days from when I first sized up this pattern from corsets and crinolines and I will have a link to the original Victorian corset pattern in the description below that is floating around on Pinterest. But seeing as I've never even done any corset making here on the channel before, let's go ahead and dive on in. So yes, we'll be starting with this late 1880s corset pattern from Nora Waugh's Corsets and Crinolines, which I did use to make my black silk corset that you have seen me wear here on the channel before. And in general, this pattern fits me quite well. I was very lucky. This used to lace completely closed, actually, when I first made it back in 2014, but things have shifted a tiny bit since then. And now only the very top of it closes because it's probably a little bit too high. This pattern does still need a few modifications to fit me personally perfectly. But here is the exact pattern that I started with, again, that I will link below for you. This is a page out of the book Corsets and Crinolines, which I actually do not own a copy of, but many pages of this book are floating around over on Pinterest. And as we can see, each side of this corset is made up of five curvy little panels that once sewn together obviously create quite an hourglass shape. This original corset had a spoon busk in the front, so instead of just having a straight busk like my corset has, uh, this actually has a spoon-shaped busk, which is a bit larger piece of steel, it's a bit curvier. And when I had made that black corset, I had only ever inserted one busk before, and it was a straight busk for an Edwardian corset, so I really wasn't comfortable with setting in a spoon busk, so I did skip it for my original Victorian corset. And if any of you have ever used a PDF or a print at home pattern, you will be used to these little rulers that you can see in the bottom right hand side of this pattern here. This is just showing the actual scale of this pattern. So when I printed this out nearly 10 years ago, I needed to make sure that the scale of the corset was correct and that the sections of this little ruler came out to one inch exactly. And I got very, very lucky with this pattern. Once I printed it out, you can see I printed this out just on regular computer paper. Once I printed this out, cut everything out, got everything taped together, it turned out that the top of this corset was around 30 and a half inches, the waist was around 20 and a half inches, and the hip was around 30 and a half inches, which is great news for me because my measurements at that time were exactly 10 inches larger than this, which meant to grade up this pattern, I didn't have to do a whole lot of math because I just went ahead and added a half inch along each of the five panels, one inch for five panels on each side, that's 10 inches all around, sizing this corset up to my size. So I added a half inch along the side seams of all of these panels, and then of course an additional half inch as well for seam allowance so I could sew these pieces together. I did also add an inch to both the top and the bottom of each piece so that I could play with the length, how far it came up on the bust and how far it came down on the hip. My next step was to go ahead and make a very rudimentary mock-up. I used some very thick muslin that I had in my stash, which is not the you know best approximation of what a finished corset will be like, and practice setting in the busk in that to see how this pattern would fit me. And this mock-up did close completely in the back, which I was not surprised about, especially because one layer of muslin cotton is gonna stretch a lot more than um, a herringbone twill or a twill or a coatil will. So I wasn't surprised that this closed up all the way in the back, especially because this corset pattern is extremely similar to my body measurements. And I did make that black corset that you have seen. It actually is mauve on the inside like this to the best of my ability at that time, you know, nearly 10 years ago now. And I think I have improved my sewing skills, uh, if not, practiced my corsetry skills much in the in-between years. And I had not made another corset since, not since 2014. But luckily, I still had this pattern. So I had this exact pattern that I was working with nearly a decade ago, sitting in one of these Ziploc bags. So I could bring it out and I'm actually wearing the corset here so I can look in the mirror and decide what changes I want to make. But I'm not gonna make changes to this pattern because it's a rare survivor at this point, uh, being a pattern that I've had for nearly a decade and managed to not lose somehow in all the different organizations and cleanups of this room. And because despite my black corset not fitting me perfectly, I still really do like this pattern. I like the way the corset feels. I've built a lot of costumes on top of it. I don't wanna lose the original copy of this. So I will go ahead and trace a new copy to work with and modify for today. When you're going to be making any dramatic changes to something, which I'm actually not gonna make that dramatic of changes to this today, it's really a good idea to make those changes on a new copy and keep each version. Just make sure you have everything labeled correctly. Um, so you will know, you know, version A, B, C, one, two, three, whatever you wanna do. Um, so you can go ahead and revert back if things don't work out with your new version. Um, you still have the original pattern to work with, which is nice. I will label these one, two, three, four, which way is up, which way the grain needs to be on these. And I am going to go ahead and take a measuring tape and I'm again wearing, you can kind of see the bow. It actually matches this corset black and 
Yellow matches my Empire Strikes Back t-shirt I'm wearing quite well here. Um, but I am taking my measuring tape and measuring along my hip line to kind of find where my waist is sitting at in this corset. This, this corset fits my natural waist quite well, but I just want to be able to mark that waistline on these pattern pieces because I'm going to flare it out a little bit at the hips from there. But what I'm starting with is actually just raising the bust line here. So I'm adding about an inch on and then right where the first panel meets the second, I'm going to have that tip up a little bit just for a little bit of a fun shape of an overbust here. This is not like cupping fully over the bust, but it's definitely higher than my uh, Victorian corset is all on its own. Just wanted to raise that up so it's less scandalous to wear on its own. But here you can see I'm marking that waist line on all these pieces as best I can, measuring myself. That way I can start to take this in a little bit at the waist because I'm a very squishy person. So I've always felt I could get more spring or squish out of this corset pattern if I wanted to. Um, I think a curvier godade corset pattern would give me a different more curvier shape. Um, this corset pattern is kind of a very standard hourglass. It's not super exaggerated. I think I could probably get away with an exaggerated one, but not using this pattern. I think I need to try a different corset pattern in the future to achieve that kind of effect. So for this, I'm just going to try and exaggerate what I've got a tiny bit more, but not epically. So I'm going to take about a fourth of an inch away at the waist, and I'm going to flare the bottom of the corset about a fourth of an inch on each side. Um, for most of these pieces, sometimes I flared it out to about a full half inch on either side. My thinking here being that if I were to squeeze the waist more, that flesh has to go somewhere. So I want to go ahead and make sure the hips and the bust area are a little bit bigger so that that flesh has somewhere to go when the corset is restricting my waist, I guess. So all I have done here is raised that bust line on the first two panels and then added a little bit of flare from the waist down, taking a tiny bit off the waist, adding a tiny bit to the hip for most of this. And I'll just be seeing what that does, honestly, because I'm not uh, very well versed in corset patterning or uh, fitting, that's for sure. I'm not a very good tailor when it comes to like fitting garments in general. Uh, luckily I fit my bodice block to me, you know, several years ago now and I haven't had to mess with it. Whereas uh, corsetry, that's, uh, that's a whole nother level of fitting that I am not trained in sadly enough, but I will just go ahead and try my best. So you can see all along the bottom here, I've added, except for the front panel, because I don't want to flare the front panel out away from my body too much, which in the end this still does, but all along the bottom pieces of these from the waist down, I've taken a tiny bit off the waist and added a little bit to the hip. The other thing I'm going to do here is in this seam between the front and second piece, I am just going to cut a sliver away at the top of this just to make sure that that cups over the bust instead of flaring out too much as well. So I'm just taking a couple little tiny triangles off the top of that so that it will curve over the bust now that I'm going kind of above apex level, whereas the corset really finished at apex level beforehand. And those were my initial modifications. I wanted to see if this was going to work. So I went ahead and made up a corset in two layers using one layer of black cotton twill from around my studio and one layer of black cotton sateen. And here of course is that finished corset. As we can see, the back does not fit perfectly. And in fact, the front didn't either, but the little darts I had to put into the front are not seen under all this beadwork. And no, these sleeves don't want to stay up even though they are tacked to the corset itself. But I do have a diamond shaped lacing gap in the back of this, indicating that I have messed up the size of this buddy. Because you can have a lacing gap, that's fine. Or if your corset closes, honestly, that's okay. It's just that you don't want to have either a V, an A shape, this sort of O or diamond shape that I have. You really want the back ends of your corset to be parallel. That is the, that is the main goal here. Whether they're an inch apart, three inches apart, or close in the back, parallel is what you're looking for. So because I have added flare to the bottom of this corset pattern, the hips are now a little bit too big. And actually I didn't remove anything from the very top of this pattern. So as my first corset did with this, it nearly closes in the back. This one still nearly closes in the back. And I did take a little bit away from the waist on this. So the waist is giving me a nice sized lacing gap, but the rest of my gap does not, is not playing ball here. But we can take a look at this garment in a little bit more detail here. Again, this is a black cotton sateen on the outside here. I have a layer of this rather web-like lace on the outside, and then I used some sequined lace motifs here to cover everything up and make it sparkly and fun. And these are just tacked onto the outer layer of the corset by hand, hand stitching all this on. Luckily, I didn't have to hand bead this. This is a beaded fringe that I tacked on here, and uh, all of this is hand sewn on, some bits of this more loosely than others. And then of course the top edge of the corset, while it is bound in cotton sateen, it has also got this nice wide, probably five or six inch wide ruffle of this lace on it as well to give me a little bit more coverage because this still, I needed to raise the bust even a little bit more to feel totally comfortable in this. And right here in the front between panel one and two is where I had to add in a little dart 
because this really wanted to stick away from the body and the front at this point, which is not completely inaccurate for a Victorian corset of this period, but was not what I was looking for for a more modern inspired garment. And of course the finishing touch on this outfit was to have my beaded cicada pinned at the center front there, so I'll just take that buddy off for now. And in fact, I'm probably going to recycle this corset, uh, take all the boning out of it, take all of the trim off of it actually, and make a new version because this pattern uh, doesn't fit perfectly. And something else that is contributing to the fit on this not being perfect is that these grommets are set a little bit too far apart. I think I went an inch and a quarter, which really I shouldn't have these be more than an inch apart, um, especially at the waist where this garment is getting the most stress, of course. And because these grommets are only going through two layers of fabric and my grommet setter is annoying, uh, which we will talk about later, I have like an expensive hand-pressed grommet setter and I don't like it at all. So for those of you who do a lot of grommets, tell me your favorite method of setting those in there because I do not like my grommet setter. And because of the additional stress the imperfect pattern is causing on this back lacing area, some of these grommets are already ripping out of this cotton, uh, the two layers of cotton. The grommets are the thing that caused me the most headache in corset making. So and part of the reason I set my grommets so far apart is because that meant I would need to put less of them in. And my grommet setter, you know, it's a 60-40 it's a sort of chance on whether or not it's going to give me a nice grommet or a chewy, disgusting, sad grommet. And therefore I'm afraid to use my grommet setter and that's why I wanted to do less grommets, but that does affect the fit. So I need a new grommet setting situation. These little sleeves are just uh, like my sleeve pattern with the tops cut off to make a little band. And then I use a little diamond of fabric here to attach those to the corset. This is just tacked into place so that I can remove these little sleeveies anytime I want to, which is good because again, I probably am going to be remaking this corset. And this is laced with some black waxed cotton cord here. So now that I know how that fits, let's go ahead and fix up this pattern once again. I am going to raise this top piece a little bit further, adding on another 5 eighths of an inch here just because I want this to truly be an overbust and not be super scandalous. That's right. Not that I won't be wearing a shirt underneath the copper corset in the end anyway, but you get the idea. And again, I need to add that same 5 eighths of an inch along the seam line here. I'll go ahead and walk that seam to make sure I've got it in the exact place I need to. So this piece actually I needed to add even more than 5 eighths of an inch, as you can see, to really even that out. Like so. Of course, I don't need that extra inch underneath my arm, so it just tapers down to nothing just raising the very front of the corset over the bust. And I definitely want this to flare over my front belly less. So I'm gonna cut a little sliver off this front piece to start with. And then because the whole thing honestly is a little bit big, let's just take a quarter inch off the back. I'm just gonna go ahead and make sure that's not a problem anymore. If anything, I'd rather it be too small at this point, honestly. And I'll just straighten out a couple of these lines across the rib cage up here, taking a little bit of space off of the top. And definitely I'm going to remove some of these sections of fullness I added. So here I have about a half inch. I'm gonna take an eighth of an inch off of that. I'm gonna take a little bit off the back length. I'm really just, you know, trying to refine what I've got going on here. These are very small modifications, but in a corset, small modifications can make a big difference. And here's that black corset without all of its beads. And before I had even bound the top of it, of course I had tried it on and immediately made changes to my pattern um, just before I lost track of anything that needed to be fixed. And if I tape all of my pattern pieces together, overlapping the seam allowance, that half inch, that it will be eventually sewn. I can go ahead and make a pattern for the flappy thing, as it says here on the pattern. <clears throat> sort of like a collar for the top of the corset, which I don't know what I would call that. So as you can see on the pattern piece, I wrote flappy thing. So here's my pattern piece for the flappy thing. That's how I made that. I just layered my corset pattern closed together along the top and then traced that edge and made a two and a half inch wide flappy thing. And for this, I will go ahead and cut the outside of these flappies out of the same copper fabric the corset will be made out of, and then the underside, the inside lining of them, will be cut out of the aqua colorway of the same metallic shantung. Now while for the black corset I actually did use a two-layer corset construction method, this time I'll be using a single layer for the structure of this corset. Of course the fashion fabric and the lining I add mean this is actually a three-layer corset, but all the structure is in this inside twill layer here. So this is some organic cotton twill from moodfabrics.com that I have left over from that stripy jacket I made earlier in the summer. And I'm going to use this to make this corset. Is twill the very best fabric for a corset? No, especially if you want a lot of waist reduction. You have to be very perfectly on grain to not get some weird stretch out of it. If you have a herringbone twill, that's much better. And of course, Cotil, which is a fabric specifically made for making corsets, is best of all. But I was using what I had on hand, of course. But making sure I'm keeping everything on the straight grain, I will cut all of my panels out of that gray cotton twill and out of this metallic copper shantung. That 
that Shantung does like to fray really quickly, so I wanted to make sure I was being careful with it. And then where these panels get sewn together, I will be creating a boning channel. I'll be going ahead and constructing this corset that using welt seams all around the main body, connecting the panels together. But of course I need more boning panels than just the seam lines of this, so I'm kind of consulting the original pattern here to see where they were. For the two back pieces, pieces three and four, there are pieces down the center. For pieces one and two, those lines are actually quite curvy. So I'm doing my best to replicate that curve as well. Um, even though, of course, these bones are in a different place on the original pattern than they would be on my size. Like if I were to actually have my size of pattern, I'm sure the Victorians would have drawn the boning channels in different places. But I'm doing my best here. Again, not an expert in corsetry, just winging it, you know? So here I'm using some clover tracing paper and a tracing wheel to trace on the curvier boning channels on this center front panel here. And as, and of course, I haven't mentioned for a while, but I'm not gonna have a center front busk in this corset. The reason corsets have a busk, which originally started as a strength thing and like Regency and earlier Victorian corsetry, it usually was a wooden busk or a um, ivory or bone busk that was in the very front of a corset to keep that very straight and rigid. Uh, the busk of course evolved throughout the Victorian era to be something that had clasps that allowed for a lot more functionality. And uh, by removing the busk and these corsets here, all I'm really doing is making them harder to get off and on. So you can see from my center front panels here of my strength layer, I've just sewn those straight together, half inch seam allowance along the center front. I will use either side of that half inch seam allowance to create two boning channels down the center front. So where there would normally be a busk, which is on a steel base, like a boning, like a piece of boning anyhow, I will still have boning in that spot. It just will not have the clasps, sadly enough. Now really, finding a pattern that works for you and fitting the mock-ups and uh, figuring out your grommet setter are the hardest parts of corsetry, in my opinion. Actually putting them together is not too bad. So I have piece one on each side already sewn together down that center front, and now I'm sewing piece two for each side, left and right, onto there. I am just using my 12 stitches branch, my regular all-purpose Guterman thread over here on the machine for this, in a matching gray shade to match my strength layer here and just half inch seam allowance. That's what I added to the pattern. And that's what I will use, of course. Now, normally with a curvy seam, you see me clip my curves. I'm a big fan of clipping a curve. We're not doing that in this. This is a structural garment. In fact, I'm just going to give this a little bit of a press as best I can, try and press this seam allowance towards the side or towards the center back, I suppose. And I will stitch this down, stitch over this again, using welt seaming with a quarter inch gap between my original seam and this new one. That way I can use this as a boning channel for my quarter inch steel boning. You could also sew the center front of this last, which would make for less of a hassle over at the machine if you wanted to. Grabbing the next panels, panels three here, I will go ahead and line those up with panel two along the curvy, curvy princess seam of this, I guess. And again, stitch that. I'm going to be assembling this whole thing, all the panels in this exact same way, pressing them towards the back while seaming them down with that quarter inch gap for the boning. And now that panel three is on, I can do the same with panel four on each side. 4R and 4L, left and right, of course. Again, pressing that seam allowance towards the back as best I can and stitching it down. For the extra boning channels that are in the middle of the panels as opposed to between them, I will go ahead and use some cotton twill tape here. This is half inch wide cotton twill tape and I'm going to line that up along one side of my chalk line here and stitch down either side of this, again, leaving a quarter inch channel down the middle that I can fit my boning into. And again, all of this structural layer will be covered, so nothing of this will be seen, so it doesn't really matter that this is black boning channels on a gray corset. None of this will be seen in the final garment. But boning channel placement is another thing that I can probably improve upon. Again, I haven't made a corset since 2014, so I've been focusing on fitting, I guess, normal clothes as opposed to fitting corsetry which is just a different ball game. I can fit a bodice over a corset, 
but that's more like regular tailoring as opposed to the corsetry itself because normally in clothes you're making the clothes that fit the body in corsetry you're making the body fit the silhouette you're after so it's a much it's a different ball game truly i don't even know where you would go to like take a class on fitting corsetry classes like in person if there's a fashion degree program out there that actually has a foundations or corsetry class as part of it that would be really amazing maybe somewhere in their costuming there might be a theater like theatrical costuming or movie costuming degrees out there if, if any of you have ever heard of one that has a corsetry program i'd love to hear about it honestly i think they'll let me come in even though i'm not getting a degree who knows Now, of course, I need to assemble all the panels for the outside of my corset in this copper fabric as well, but I'll be using the same construction methods even though I'm not going to be putting any boning into this layer itself. So I'm going to stitch the panels together with that half inch seam allowance, and this time instead of pressing the seam allowance towards the back, I'm going to press it towards the center front just to alternate the seam allowances so they don't get too bulky in the finished garment. But I'm going to press the seam allowances towards the center front as best I can. And again, I will top stitch those down flat, this time using the other side of my presser foot, which is a little over an eighth of an inch instead. So slightly narrower top stitching on this because this is going to be the outside of my garment eventually. And because I'm working on the fashion fabric layer as opposed to the structural layer, I will go ahead and clip the curve a little bit in the back here just because these seams are so curvy and press them as flat as I can. And you can see how much shape those panels create all on their own, especially in this stiff Shantung fabric. This is a Lurex and Acetate blend, I believe. I actually haven't done a burn test on this, but once you start working with fabric for a very long time, you can kind of tell the difference between a polyester and an acetate in your hands. Acetate has such a crispy, papery feel to it that I think that's what's blended in here. But this Shantung is actually a blend of like a dark maroon thread, a copper Lurex thread, obviously, and a black like polyester thread, I think. So there's kind of a lot going on here. This might actually be a vintage fabric. I have no idea because the shop I got it from, Allen's uh, Bridal and Fine Fabrics here in Denver, they have a lot of dead stock kicking around their store. So it's kind of impossible, but that store has been open since the like late sixties and there's a lot of dead stock kicking around still. So it's kind of impossible to know exactly when some of the fabrics are from. And here I am taking all the steel boning I own and trying to find lengths that match, which was quite the hassle. I, I had no 11 inch bones in stock, which was such a problem because for most, like for half of these boning channels, I needed a bone that was 11 inches long. So ugh, for some reason I had a lot of longer boning in stock. So um, you can trim these and then you have to like dip the ends so that they aren't gonna rust or poke you and things like that. So I just like to find boning that's the right size. And because I was making these the week before I needed to film the finished looks, I didn't have time to wait for my usual boning sources to ship them to me. And there's nowhere in Denver that actually sells steel boning. They don't have it at Allen's and they used to have it at Colorado slash Denver Fabrics, but that store is no longer with us and therefore I can't get boning there. That's where I used to buy steel boning. I do normally purchase this quarter inch flat steel boning from a Etsy shop called Make It Yourself and I will link to them below. That's where I normally like to source my boning from, but I didn't have time to wait for it to ship to me. But luckily in this modern capitalistic nightmare, I could get 11 inch spiral steel boning delivered next day from Amazon. So that's what I did. I will link that boning below as well. It really saved my bacon on this project. Now, of course, because I will be binding the top and bottom edges of this corset, I need a half inch of fabric free of boning to do so at the top and bottom. So I don't want any of this boning to be the exact length of these boning channels. I need it to be around three quarters to an inch shorter, honestly. So keep that in mind when purchasing boning. Uh, measure your corset pattern first and order your boning in advance if you are like me and don't have a supplier near you. Sadly, I do not have instant access to corsetry materials myself. Now, before I can bind the top edge of this buddy and put all these layers together, I do need to start thinking about my flappy thingies here. I'm just gonna go ahead and sew the like front and back and bottom edge of these right sides together. Again, with that sort of aqua verdigris color on the inside and the copper on the outside. Just putting my last few pieces of boning here into the center back boning channel here. The back of this corset could probably use a little bit more boning as well. Something to keep in mind for the future. Now I'm going to layer all three layers of this corset together 
Yeah, it's a one-layer corset that happens to have three layers. You know, I did cut out a lining in iridescent silk taffeta using the same exact pattern, and I just simply sewed those together with half-inch seam allowance. But I will layer the lining on, and then now this is like my right side of my lining, if that makes any sense. So I'll put the right side of my outer fabric along this and line those up along the center back so that I can sew these together along the center back and then turn everything right side out. And I will go ahead and press that seam allowance so everything starts to play nicely here. I only did that along one of the back edges here, by the way. And then I will go ahead and pin that into place just so that it holds so I can take this back over to the machine and sew a quarter inch boning channel along this very center back. And while I'm doing that, I'm just gonna pin the other side together so that things don't get too messy during this process. It's not a long way from the ironing board to the machine, but just long enough that something can go wrong, you know? And then I can insert my piece of boning into that center back boning channel on that side. Uh, this fabric, of course, the twill layer stretches a little bit more than the shantung does. So I'm just stretching everything to fit along the seam lines and pinning it together because I'm going to coax the fabric to do what I want, honestly. Um, it's all cut out with the same pattern and therefore it all should fit in the end if I force it to. <clears throat> so that's what I'm gonna do. Now for the other back edge of this, I really should have slip stitched this. I actually did it by machine because again, I was on a bit of a time crunch for this whole endeavor. But for this side, I actually am just going to fold each layer in its half inch, line them all up uh, so that it looks like I did it the way that the other side is done. Um, but I will just stitch right along the edge of these to get these layers together and then again create a boning channel a quarter of an inch away. I did the two back edges differently like this just in case it had stretched quite a lot and I needed to compensate for that. Like if the outer layer had stretched a ton and the twill layer was still quite, you know, the original size, I wanted to be able to fold the outer layer in an inch to make up for that difference. Um, but luckily because this shantung is so crispy, it didn't stretch hardly at all. So. I probably could have sewn the back edge of this the same way, that first way for both sides of this and then turned everything right side out, but I was just in a fearful mood, you know? So I'd rather have an extra line of stitching right along the back edge of this that no one will ever know about than have a mistake at this point. But I'll just pin those layers together and again, stitch right along the edge of this. And then another line of stitching a quarter inch away so I could stick that last piece of boning in there. And I'm ready to start thinking about how I'm going to bind this buddy. I have some two inch wide strips of bias that I cut from the copper shantung here that I can stitch together to go ahead and bind this bottom edge. Just trying to conserve fabric as much as possible. So I need to stitch the ribbon together before I could use it as binding here. Normally I press things into double fold bias tape, but for this first edge, I just wanted to go ahead and try folding this directly in half and using the bias tape in a little bit different way. I think I still prefer the double fold, so I'll be doing that in the future. And I still have my flappy thingies. So now that they're sewn together, I can go ahead and trim the corners and clip the curves and turn these right side out. On something like this, you could do under stitching or edge stitching, but of course I'm going to do top stitching because it's me, that's right. No one will ever see this top stitching except for you right now. So <laughs> enjoy the fact that I'm going to do a couple of rows of top stitching with little geometric details that no one will ever know about. And you'll notice on these flappy thingies, which are like a collar, um, that I didn't use any interfacing on these. Uh, if I was using a floopier fabric, I would have, but as you can see, this fabric, again, these are not metal threads. This is just plastic, AKA Lurex, but it, it holds its shape quite well. So I didn't think I needed to interface either layer of this because it was already crispy enough all on its own. And these are just gonna get layered onto the corset along the top before I put the corset binding in later. So you will see that when we get to that step here. Again, I'm going to use a quarter inch gap and do some top stitching around the edge of this in another row with that same quarter inch. And then for this last third row, I will go ahead and put in these little rectangle bump outs in this last line, which I think is quite fun in Art Deco if you're ever close enough to see that it's there. I have seen a lot of historic armor pieces from different cultures and centuries that utilize quilted pieces either in the armor itself or as padding underneath pieces of armor. So I thought the idea of doing a little bit of multiple row top stitching like this kind of added in that little bit of a quilting element that tied into the armor inspiration for the rest of this garment. But now that I can set my flappies aside, I'll go ahead and stitch on that bias tape all along the bottom edge of my corset here. I tried something different with how I folded and sewed the tippy point of this and it didn't work. So we're not gonna talk about it, okay? I had to kind of do some triage uh, to fix that situation in the end. So 
Ah, one day I'll get my points in bias perfect, but it is not this day. So I have this right sides together along the outside bottom edge of this corset. I've moved all the boning up into the top half of this boning channel, so I have no fear of hitting the um, boning with my needle here. Of course, that will break your needle. If your margins between your edge of your corset and your boning is quite close, you might want to go ahead and wear safety goggles while doing this, because if you hit a piece of steel, that needle's gonna break. Uh, if, if hopefully just the needle and not your machine as well, but half inch seam allowance and 12 stitches per inch as per usual with me. And of course, now I can fold my bias to the inside, pin that down into place, and I will go ahead and fell this down along the inside of my lining. Just hand stitch that down. It doesn't actually take that long. I guess I'm, maybe I'm not very meticulous about my felling, and therefore it would take longer if I was making my stitches perfect. But it's the inside of the corset. No one's going to see that. I'm more concerned about the functionality than the uh, how pretty and even my stitches are. The Victorians aren't coming from the past to get mad at me for my copper corset, you know? And here I am fiddling with a dang tip of this that I really just messed up, honestly. So I can pin down the rest of this and hope that all things can be saved with a little hand stitching. And of course, I need to go ahead and bind the top edge as well. I'm going to do this in three pieces, however. So I'm going to actually bind this center crescent neckline first. So I'm taking a smaller piece of my bias binding here and pinning right sides together all along this front curve. It's the same method here. I'm just going to be doing this in three pieces. The center piece first, then I'm going to layer my flappies on, and then bind either side. So that's sewn on, I can flip it to the inside, and again, hand fell this down along the inside. You could slip stitch it for an invisible finish if you wanted to as well. But I kind of like the way felling looks, honestly. And here's what that looks like all finished up. Again, I've done one side here, I'll do the other. So I'm going to pin my flappy thingy on first, into place. Make sure all my layers are properly lining up here. Because again, this is a three layer, <clears throat> single layer corset. Doesn't make much sense, but one layer is the strength layer, structural layer, and everything else is just there to be pretty, you know? No surprise there. So I'll layer my flappy thingy in there, like so, and then I can bind this top edge. Binding a corset is no big deal. Binding stays with tabs. That's, that's where binding will get you, but a corset is no problem because, like simple curves, no issue. It's the, uh, it's just those tabs on stays that'll really get you. Haunt your memories forever. You, you do it once or twice. You never really want to do it again. If you love binding stay tabs, good for you. And when I make some, will you come to mine? But I figured with my skill level, <clears throat> this would give me the sharpest points here at the very top neckline of my corset. So this is what I went with. I'll just pin on my bias here. And for the sides of this top binding, I am going to hand slip stitch this all down along the front and then fell it in the back for a perfectly invisible finish. And look, we have a corset, except for you can't try it on yet because there's no grommets. And as previously stated, grommeting, my least favorite part of corsetry, because I have this nice cast iron grommet setter for size 00, zero grommets, and I hate this thing. I hate it. At least every third grommet comes out mushed and wrong. It's like no matter how, like I'll do the process exactly the same. I'll put the grommet pieces onto the setter the exactly same way. I'll give them the same little shake so they fall perfectly into place. I will examine the grommets before I put them into the machine. I will use the exact same motion of my body and a grommet will come out perfect and then the next one will come out crunchy and half misshapen and sad. <sighs> and I just... I hate it. It's the worst part. That's why I don't put enough grommets in the back of my corsetry. It's because my grommet setter makes me want to cry. So, I mean, I this is what it looks like, by the way. Um, I could use those ones that you hammer by hand and I think I'm going to get myself one and do it. I mean, I invested in this nice grommet setter a decade ago. And I hate that thing. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So tell me what I'm doing wrong. And of course, after grommets, this corset was completely finished. I just needed some lacing. And I had ordered some cotton corset lacing from Making It Yourself, that same shop on Etsy. And then I went ahead and dyed it with my rust color of Procyon dyed from Dharma. Did it come out a little bit more burgundy? Yes. Is that still better than ivory? Also yes. So I went with it. 
with those tiny pattern modifications on this second version here in copper, I got a much better, much straighter lacing gap in the back. I think if I had more grommets spaced closer together and maybe even a few more boning channels in the back of this, this pattern would work for me to create a new Victorian corset to use in my future costuming. So I'm excited to workshop this process just a little bit more and make a new Victorian costuming corset next year. And here is my finished copper corset. Ultra metallic, ridiculous fabric that it is. This fabric comes in one additional color that I haven't played with yet. I have seen it in red, so I probably do need to go back to the fabric store and grab some of this shantung in the red just because it is so ultra metallic. It doesn't even look that metallic when it's on the bolt, but once you make it into clothes and like even the skirt panels on the finished copper ensemble, they really gleam with such a like metallic sheeting kind of finish. And we all know how I love a sparkly slash shiny lurex of any kind in a brocade in a chiffon in a shantung i love some shine thank you so much for your support on the arcana lookbook i'm really excited to share some more of the project with you in upcoming videos i hope you enjoyed seeing how this corset came together today and thank you as always for watching i'll be back with more sewing vintage fashion costuming and crafting real soon so i'll see you then bye